Hello guys and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at a first generation Intel Mac Mini that was sent to me kindly by one of my viewers. It's sitting in a box in the next room, I think it's time we open it up and see exactly what this old Mac Mini is capable of. Sorry about the lack of uploads, I actually broke one of the metal carpals in my hand, which made it very difficult to film and make videos. Anyway, I'm nearly better now, and thanks for being patient. When this package arrived a few months ago, I genuinely had no idea what was going to be inside. I'm always a little bit scared when I open packages that are sent to my PO box, which is in the description below if you want to send me something. The person who sent me this also left a note, which I'll read to you now. Hi P. Sivrai, here is my old Intel Core Duo Mac Mini. Back in the day, I had planned to make iPhone apps, but then moved on to another hobby. It had a hard life as a Plex server, but now has been replaced with Netflix and Chromecast. I'm hoping you'll find a better use for this, even if only to smother in eucalyptus spray. I think you may be able to upgrade the CPU to a 64-bit one, which might be kind of fun. Thanks for that, Adrian, and yes, I will be installing a 64-bit Core 2 Duo processor. I ended up buying a 2.16 GHz Intel T7400 for only $12 on eBay, which provides the best price to performance. Alternatively, I could have installed a 2.33 GHz T7600, but they cost upwards of 50 Australian dollars here on eBay. Adrian has definitely wrapped it quite well and also included an old iPod. I'll have to see whether it works. This is not exactly a clean Mac Mini, which is good because I love cleaning. Relievingly, it does indeed turn on. It's got a 1.86 GHz Core Duo processor and 2 GB of RAM. This model originally sold for 1249 Australian dollars back in 2006. For your money, you got a higher clocked Core Duo CPU and a slightly bigger 2.5 inch hard disk. So now that we've got it out of the box, we can see that this is indeed a first generation Intel Mac Mini. And man, I forgot how dense and little these things actually are. It's quite heavy considering how small it is, but all the air vents are absolutely clogged with dust. So that gives us another reason to open it up and also put in a solid state drive. So let's crack it open. Getting inside a Mac Mini is pretty easy. The top casing is held in place by several plastic clips. Someone has definitely opened this before as there are many chips in the metal. Lifting the lid off, we get our first look at the very dusty internals. Air is sucked in through the vents on the base. After nearly 15 years of use, I'm not surprised that the vents are clogged. To begin the disassembly, I unclipped what I believe is the Wi-Fi antenna. Next was several Phillips head screws that held the DVD drive and hard drive in place. From there, after also detaching a few ribbon cables, the whole assembly lifts off easily, revealing the internals in desperate need of a clean. I'd be curious to know if Apple is going to introduce their own silicon processor in the next Mac Mini this year, although that would probably end user upgradable RAM as well. To remove the heatsink, all I had to do was press on the four plastic clips on the underside of the logic board. Then I was able to detach the processor. Before we see just how bad that thermal paste is, let me introduce you to today's sponsor Skillshare, a great online learning community with thousands of quality classes and a diverse range of topics, allowing you to explore new skills, create new hobbies, and have a whole lot of fun while learning along the way. Since a lot of you are aspiring video makers, I'd strongly suggest you check out Geordie Vanderput's Beginner's Guide to Video Editing in Premiere Pro. Or if you're wanting to learn in Apple's Final Cut Pro, there's a great beginner's class by Ali Vandal. In addition to the video lessons, every Skillshare class gives you the ability to share your own creations with the community using the skills that you've learned along the way. Skillshare has so much to offer. If you're hungry to learn, you'll be pleased to know it's less than $10 per month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. It turns out that the heatsink didn't want to come off easily. I was being pretty gentle, but this is not exactly what I wanted to happen. The thermal paste seems to have become seemingly adhered to the processor. I'm hoping this hasn't damaged the socket as it came right out with the heatsink. I was being quite gentle, but it took a fair amount of force to separate them. Given that this video was severely delayed, the new processor actually arrived in time for the upgrade. Coming all the way from China to Australia, it didn't even take a week from purchase date. They've also included some thermal paste. Not that I'm going to be using it though. While I'm dusting off the internals, I'll simply leave the original CPU in place so that dust doesn't make its way into the socket. I was going to say that this is the dustiest Mac Mini I've ever disassembled. 
but this is actually the first one I've ever taken apart. These were made in a time back when upgradeability and long-term usability were a key part of Apple's ethos. The fact that this computer still works after many years of being clogged up with dust is a good indication of its reliability. I'm also going to open up the fan and remove as much debris as possible. On the inside, it wasn't all that bad. With a light brushing, it came up looking pretty good. While this Mac is in pieces, I'll also be putting in an inexpensive SATA SSD. Since it's only a SATA 1 1.5 gigabits per second interface, you don't have to put in a very fast drive as it will hardly reach its full potential anyway. Lifting out the old processor is very easy as it uses a ZIF socket which stands for Zero Insertion Force. And using some isopropyl alcohol I made sure that the die was clean before I applied some Arctic MX4 thermal paste. Once the heatsink is clipped back on, the paste will spread evenly over the surface. Since it was open, I also put in a new CR2032 battery. This keeps track of the time and saves PRAM information. There was a lot of grime and tarnishing, so I went over the casing with some isopropyl alcohol. Some Q-tips made it a whole lot easier getting into the air vents. Sadly, some of the foam that sits between the top and bottom casings had completely disintegrated, so I'll simply remove as much as possible. The metal has also become pretty grubby. This happens around the areas that are commonly touched, such as the power button. Using a healthy dab of eucalyptus oil, I went over all of the casing. On the top of the lid, there were a few patches of tape that I found pretty hard to remove. By simply adding some sticker removal and letting it sit for a few minutes, it came off very easily. It was at this point that I decided to install the extra RAM, bringing the system total to 3GB. This would end up being a mistake, as the system would not boot with more than 2GB of RAM before the firmware update. Either way, with a bit of elbow grease and trialing a few different chemicals, the marks on the rubber base mostly came off. Not perfect, but it's as clean as I could get it. The design of this Mac Mini lasted quite a few years. From its inception from the 2005 G4 processor, all the way up to 2009 with an Intel Core 2 Duo. Without a doubt, this is one of the most iconic Apple products of the last 20 years. Did it survive the surgery? Let's find out. When I tried to power it up, nothing showed up on screen. The fans and power light did come on though. Once again, I opened up the system and removed the extra gigabyte of RAM. Now, when plugged into power, it made the boot chime. Problem solved. And with the display plugged in, we finally get an image. You have no idea how relieved I was when this happened. I attached my Snow Leopard USB installer and it was recognized. The 120 gigabyte SSD was also recognized. I wasn't sure whether there were going to be compatibility issues. It doesn't look like there are as it made it all the way to the first time boot video. Here we are with a fresh copy of Snow Leopard 10.6. As we can see, the new processor has been recognized. To enable the use of newer operating systems and have a maximum of 3GB of RAM, I installed DOSDUDE's 2.1 firmware updater, which is also linked in the description. Upon powering it up, I held the power button as instructed. Then a short time later, I disconnected the power supply before finally turning it on once again. Here it is with the 2.1 firmware. Opening it up one more time, I added another gigabyte of RAM. And after the final upgrade, we're seeing the three gigabytes of DDR2 memory. I think now is a great time to set the Mac Mini up nice and neatly. The addition of USB ports on the cinema display is quite handy, although the Intel Mac Minis now have four USB ports instead of two that could be found on the G4s. Here we've got the freshly cleaned and upgraded Mac Mini. I think it's time we install some software and see exactly what this old machine can do. After attempting to install some software, I quickly realized that not a lot of programs were still supported in the last release of Snow Leopard 10.6.8. Even though we've installed a Core 2 Duo 64-bit processor and updated the firmware, we cannot install Lion 10.7 without modifications to the installer. Looking online, there are a few different methods. I chose to go with DOSDUDE's one tutorial, which is also linked in the description. This included an already modified image that you simply had to clone to another partition. After around 7 minutes, we had our Lion partition installed. With all the files in place, we should be able to simply boot the Mac straight into 10.7 Lion. After holding the Alt key on startup, I was able to select the Lion partition. Sadly, it wouldn't boot any further than the Apple logo. Some people apparently had success booting from an external drive or USB stick. This ended up taking far longer than I was expecting. Nearly 20 hours later, it was still copying over the files. 
But after all that time, I inserted another USB to copy files and it ejected all of the connected USB drives just as it was about to finish the clone. I ended up doing the clone to a USB on another computer and it ended up only taking a few minutes. So that was a bit of time wasted but it still wouldn't boot past the Apple logo. While it is possible to even install operating systems newer than Lion, I was really running out of time, so I decided to simply run whatever I could in Snow Leopard instead. Playing a bit of Minecraft in survival mode was possible. The frame rate wasn't great, I got about 15 FPS with the render distance set to 8. Keep in mind this is without Optifine, so there is a chance that it could run slightly better than this. How about we record some tunes in GarageBand as well? Using iMovie, I thought I'd create a short video using some clips I shot during the restoration. The 4K footage imported fine straight out of my camera, although iMovie does lower the resolution significantly. You can opt to import the clips at full quality, but let's just say it did not run very well when I did that. I also recorded some ad-lib dialogue. Let's see how that turned out. And here we've got the new 2006 Mac Mini. Looks pretty much just the same as the G4 Mac Mini. Except this time it's got lots more computational power. Definitely got a few more ports as well. A lot more USB ports. Look at that. That's how you put a USB port in. You'll never get it right the first time. And that's what it looks like with a nice big 23 inch cinema display. Quite good I must say. And you can see it's right there. This little unit. But that unit packs a lot of power. While I've got you here, I thought I would show you how to make an eye-catching YouTube thumbnail that guarantees to get a lot of views. Adding lots of colourful outer glows and saturation is 100% essential. In addition, every thumbnail must contain arrows and circles, just in case the viewer doesn't know exactly what they're supposed to be looking at. And then once you think you're done, add even more saturation to give it that nice fried look. Ah, that is a true masterpiece. In the future, I'll try to get a newer OS installed. That'll likely make the web browsing experience far more tolerable. It's been very fun cleaning up and upgrading this first generation Intel Mac Mini. It's great to see that they can still be used nearly 15 years later. So there we have it, Apple's first generation Intel Mac Mini. I honestly think the design is pretty cool and it was a lot of fun using one of these and cleaning it out and it really needed a clean out. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, feel free to leave a like. And if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next video.